first lecture yesterday, I made the observation that what I described on the authority of others as biblicism is regarded as one of the characteristic marks of evangelicalism. I suggested that this is seen in a wide range of ministries devoted to the study of the Bible, but this has included both the publication and translation of the scriptures and material designed to help the individual reader to understand and apply the Bible to themselves. I think my observation was supported uh, in some of the other papers that we were given yesterday uh, because in those papers the commitment to Bible study, to Bible commentary, uh, to daily Bible reading uh, was demonstrated and has been demonstrated in this conference. There are not many conferences I go to, even theological conferences, where we start each day with the scriptures. So we are demonstrating uh, our own personal commitment uh, to a biblical uh, faith, the biblicism of which evangelicalism is sometimes being identified. So although I could have chosen one of the other recognized characteristics of evangelicalism to focus upon this morning uh, in this second address, I've decided to explore more fully uh, biblicism this morning. And the reason for that is that a clear perspective on this emphasis within evangelicalism is required to help us, whether that's a Britisher or somebody from Georgia or Armenia, uh, to understand and conduct ourselves as evangelicals within our context. Our context is different, but if we understand what evangelicals have said about the Bible, I think that will help us as we address the challenges that face us both within and without our churches. Historically, Biblicism owes its inspiration to one of the solar of the Reformation. This conference is called the Solar Forum because it seeks to establish uh, the principles of the solar, the own of the Reformation. Christ alone, faith alone, and so on. And the scriptures were one of those solar, solar scriptura. So that Biblicism owes its origin to the Re Reformation, where the Re Reformers insisted on solar scripture, and they did so, and one of the characteristics of their rejection of Roman Catholicism. From their perspective, the Roman Catholic Church had obscured the meaning of the Bible, and had done that in a number of ways. They had used the authority of tradition, the traditions of the church. They had used the authority of papal statements. And they had interpreted the Bible on a multi, in, in a multi-level way so as to overturn what the reformers believed was a plain sense of scripture. So over against what does the scripture say, uh, they would argue that the Roman Catholic Church said, what does the Pope say? What do the traditions of the church say? Uh, and their own particular interpretive techniques uh, had been used to bolster tradition and paper authority. And uh, the reformers said, no, it is the scripture alone 
and in particular scripture as plainly understood. They were also responding to the denial of the Roman Catholic Church of access to the Bible, to allow the Bible to be freely available to uh, non-priests, uh, the reason being given that if non-priests had Bibles and read them, they might come to different conclusions. Uh, so in the face of all this, the reformers sought to ensure that the Bible could be read by all and be understood by all. One of the first things that Martin Luther did was to translate the Bible into German so that his German constituency were able to read the Bible for themselves. One of his greatest works is his commentary on the Epistle to the Galatians, which I commented upon last year at this conference, uh, which was his commitment to expounding the text of Scripture. And his great contemporary, John Calvin, a large part of his work that exists to this day are his commentaries on the text of Scripture. So these men devoted themselves to expounding the biblical text, placing an emphasis upon the original author's intention and on seeking to apply what was said then to the context in Germany or Switzerland, wherever they were called to minister. So evangelicals have, the evangelical commitment to scripture is first of all based upon the sola of the Reformation, sola scriptura. But evangelicalism as it developed in the 18th century had another uh, context in which it affirmed sola scriptura. At their time, Rationalism was beginning to place the authority of human reason above the authority of scripture. And so evangelicals reaffirmed sola scriptura in their writings, uh, in their teaching, and ultimately in their confessions of faith. And they spoke of the authority and the inspiration of scripture as a mark of their movement. So they stood over against the, what they believed to be the excesses of Roman Catholicism, which had obscured the Word of God. And they stood over against rationalism, which was seeking to claim a greater authority, even in the reading of Scripture, than the authority of God himself. And this authority was rooted in the, it's what they called the inspiration of the Bible. A word that was based upon Paul's comment in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. Where Paul says, all scripture is God breathed. It was inspired. It was the breathing out of God himself. And in using this word, evangelicals were claiming that the whole of the Bible, down to the individual words, and even to the punctuation, were breathed out by God. Now in making this claim, they rejected the idea that the human authors were merely robots. Sometimes evangelicals are criticized uh, by, in their view of inspiration, by saying it's almost as though uh, the Bible writers were the fingers that touch the typewriter keys, uh, whereas the mind is the mind of God, so that the human authors had no contribution to make to the writing of Scripture. Now evangelicals recognized that the authors were human authors. They recognized the individuality of the authors and their situations. But they argued that the Holy Spirit uniquely worked through these men and women so that they alone 
spoke the words, the very words of God himself. The corollary of arguing that God's word was inspired and the scriptures alone had that authority was that evangelicals claimed the Bible was infallible. In other words, just as God is true and truth, so the words of the Bible which were spoken through human authors were themselves true and truthful. Later under challenges from those on the margins of the evangelical movement, the word uh, infallible was replaced or supplemented by the word inerrant, without error. In this way, evangelicals sought to affirm both the truthfulness of the message and the accuracy of the Bible on all matters upon which it spoke. So, whether it was on a matter of history, or a matter of ethical statement, or whatever it was, when the Bible spoke, evangelicals said, God was speaking, and was speaking without it containing any error. Now, there are some still who insist that the Greek text published by Erasmus uh, was itself uniquely overseen by God, so that that Greek text is the text that should be the authoritative text of the New Testament that we use today. In actual fact, most evangelicals have recognized that because of the transmission uh, through handwritten copies of the Bible for many centuries, uh, actually, the copies that came down to us were fallible copies. And it's interesting that evangelicals have been at the forefront of seeking to develop the skills uh, to ensure that the texts that we have are as near accurate to the originals as possible. This is one of the most recent copies of the Greek New Testament. Uh, and uh, it has an apparatus in it uh, to help uh, identify where there are differences within the handwritten tradition uh, and to develop skills to enable someone to work out what was originally written by Mark or Matthew or whoever. But the point I'm making is that the main person responsible for this work over the last 50, 60, 70 years was a man by the name of Bruce Metzger, who himself came from an evangelical background. So evangelicals have been committed uh, not only to uh, uh, arguing the inspiration and inerrancy of scripture, but also ensuring that the texts that we have in front of us are the very uncorrupted words of the original uh, authors. Now, on the basis of these beliefs, evangelicals sought to explain the Bible. While popular piety has, to some extent, allowed for allegorical and other spiritualizing means of interpreting the text of scripture. Most have insisted, most evangelicals have insisted that the starting point for Bible study is to uncover the original meaning of the text and then to, to, to seek to apply that meaning either directly or by analogy to the current context of individuals and groups. At the same time, of course, such study has benefited from the work of others. Evangelicals rarely simply open their Bibles. Uh, they usually have alongside of them a Bible atlas, 
or a handbook uh, which helps identify who the Pharisees and Sadducees are, and so on and so forth. Uh, they have encyclopedias and books that help uh, the historical and cultural background. Commentaries to explain the text have abounded and continue to abound. For those of us who are scholars, the only problem with that is that in my lifetime they get bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, I was recently working on the prophet Habakkuk in a commentary that was that size. Uh, but whatever the justification for that, at least in theory, evangelicals have seen these books as fallible aids to assist them in the reading of scripture and that the ultimate authority rests on the Bible itself. So evangelical theology and the spirituality it has engendered is centered on the revelation of God through his very words recorded in the Bible. These words carry the authority of deity itself Words that provide the basis for all of our knowledge of Him. While not therefore denying mystical experiences, even our experiences are to be interpreted and made sense of within the framework of the revelation of God in Scripture. So that's the fundamental position that evangelicalism has adopted over other forms of, of Christianity uh, down the centuries. Now, these historical affirmations and convictions have been subject to challenge and clarification. And it's to these challenges and the responses that evangelicals have made, I now want to turn, because they inevitably bear upon our current and contemporary situations. Rationalism has constantly proved a threat to evangelicalism. Consequently, there have always been those on the fringes of the movement, especially, I have to say, those working within university environments, who have sought to refine or explain away some of the claims that I have outlined already. Uh, in particular, there's been a challenge to verbal accuracy. Um, and this has occurred from, the, the challenge has come from two separate general directions. The first one is historical. It has been sought to be claimed that when evangelicals have claimed uh, that the reformers and early evangelicals were committed to the inerrancy of scripture, but actually they weren't. But Luther and Calvin, the great leaders of the Great Awakening, were not men who claimed to be the uh, accuracy of scripture. Sometimes those claims continue to be heard today. I have to say they seem to be heard less often because I think the answers that were given to those claims have shown that they were false. But actually the reformers and the early, evangelical, early evangelicals did believe in an error-free uh, Bible. But the other development has been in attempts to limit the areas in which the Bible is without error. Thus, it has been sometimes said that the Bible can be recognized as accurate in matters of faith, but it can be inaccurate, contain errors in matters of historical detail. So what it says about the way of salvation in Christ is accurate, what might have been said about some details of Paul's journeys uh, through Asia Minor may contain errors. Those are two examples. Alternatively, it's been said that it may be accurate in 
matters uh, of faith, but not necessarily in matters of history, nor indeed in matters relating to its ethical statements. And so when the Bible speaks ethically, it may well be erroneous. Oh yes, it's true what it says about Jesus, but there will be historical inaccuracies and the ethical statements uh, may need to be subject to our own judgment as to whether or not they are true or truly from God. Now I'll return to some of those issues in a minute or two, uh, but I want to state here that evangelicalism has prepared sometimes uh, reluctantly to embrace those who uh, acknowledge one or two historical inaccuracies. But it has not been happy to set aside the basic claim to an infallible Bible. Uh, so it has been resistant to those who have sought, usually on grounds of rational arguments, to undermine claims of historical accuracy and ethical uh, authority. However, this lecture is devoted not simply to stating evangelical zoo of the inspiration or authority of God, but to look uh, at least briefly at how evangelicals interpret scripture. And in order to do that, we need to do something of an historical retrospect. Until the early 20th century, the study of languages was dominated by two disciplines. The discipline, disciplines of philology, uh, that is the study of language more generally, uh, but especially of, of words, and grammatology, the study of grammar. In other words, the focus uh, was upon words, and upon grammatical structures within which words are used. An underlying assumption was that individual words contain distinct meanings. And this was the era of the great dictionaries, the wonderful thick lexica in various languages, the extraordinary output of grammatical texts. They all seem to be published uh, in the 19th century and into the early 20th century. Uh, and they're works that we can still value greatly today. Uh, but a large number of them emerged in the 19th century under this commitment to philology and grammatology. And so word studies and grammatical analysis was central to the interpreter's task. If you were to work out what a text means, you study carefully the grammar, you study carefully the words, and uh, as we would say in English, English, hey presto, you get the answer to what the original pop author intended. However, in the early 20th century, the scientific study of linguistics commenced and was subsequently accompanied by an increasing interest by philosophers and literary scholars into questions as to how texts are read and heard. Linguistic analysis revealed that words do not have meanings in themselves. Their meanings are determined from the context in which they're uttered. Words then function in what has been called a semantic field, in which the particular nuance of a word is dependent upon the context in which it functions. And the context is invariably larger than an individual sentence. I could illustrate that to you, but think of almost any sentence while I'm speaking to you, and just think of that sentence 
And single that actually it conveys any meaning separate from the surrounding context of your thoughts at the moment. And that will prove, I think, the point. So the modern discipline of semantics was born from such a recognition. No longer then is a text to be understood simply by the study of word meanings and grammar. I still hear English preachers say this word means when they're preaching. And I cringe because it doesn't mean that unless it clearly means that in the context. So it's been more important it's become necessary to give greater consideration to context. And this has spawned a greater interest in, for example, sociological and historical contexts in which the texts were first written down. But this itself has raised further questions. Our knowledge of the context is often very limited. When we're reading the Bible, we're reading texts that are, that are at least 2,000 years old. The context, the historical and sociological context, and the economic context and so on, uh, of that world are largely lost to us. Uh, the data we have can often be casually obtained through a reference in a historical text, or to an archaeological discovery. But those texts and those archaeological discoveries are merely uh, the tip of a huge amount of data and material that must have existed before or may yet be discovered from us uh, in the future. So the material we have to help us is reconstruct a text and understand it from a historical, uh, sociological background uh, are perhaps not representative. Indeed, historical texts may themselves have been shaped, even preserved or destroyed on the basis of decisions taken uh, in the past. When I went up to Bible College uh, nearly 50 years ago, I had two aims. One was to learn Greek, and the other was to learn Hebrew. Anything else I learned would be a bonus. And the reason for that was that I believed that if God had called me to a Bible teaching ministry, I needed to be able to hear the text as originally written in the original languages. Now, I'm not a Greek or Hebrew specialist because I'm not a natural linguist. But I accept that there was a problem. In the English world, one of the ways of getting around that problem is the difference of multiplication of versions. Because different uh, translators or teams of translators have made different decisions. Sometimes by comparing them, you can get a sense of where there is a book. There's ambiguity. Or sometimes you can get an idea of uh, the range of potential meanings that exist. In languages where there is only one or two versions of the Bible.
there is more of a problem of a translation becoming authoritative that is actually an inaccurate translation. And that creates problems for both preachers and for those who read the Bible. And we have to handle those as best we can. Uh, it's not easy. As a preacher, um, I try to avoid those debates when I'm preaching as much as I can. But there have been occasions in which I have been unhappy with the received English translation or translations. And I've had to be honest enough to tell my hearers, I have a problem here. I think it would be better if it had been interpreted this way or that way. Just to give you one example, I have been recently preaching through the prophet Habakkuk. And at the beginning of chapter 2, Habakkuk is told of a vision that he's to wait for. But as you go through, especially verse 2 and 3, It appears to me increasingly that Habakkuk is not referring to the vision out, the vision that is to come. But to him who fulfills the vision. In other words, he's pointing forward to Christ. And so when I preached to my own congregation on that passage. I had to spell out that that's what I believe the best translation was. But we can exaggerate the problems. There are problems that occur in translations. There are difficulties in understanding what the original Hebrew and Greek meant. But generally speaking, those problems are relatively few. And we can hear God's words uh, in the versions that we have before us. By the way, Steven is Sazri, my intercepts. Is it those Algatavis context? Da, a seven context that super Amodeni Metzelia, it's nobody, my intercepts. Aristoara Raime Gans Hoveba, Imashi to Rogor Arik Meba, Dial, Gamui, and Eva Biblia. Nis context, she da, Chuentan, Evangelus Sam Aros Gulismo, and Head of Stora Raime. Context to our Tavise Burebebs, as it quat, Chuentan Biblis, Akmashi, Kadagebebshi, as to Morzuneptan Saubarshi, my intercepts, Rogoria Missi, Akmam Saketris. Very good. And as we say in English, I'm having all the heavies ask the questions this morning. Um, I think that. One of the things that has struck me in the Caucasus is that culturally you are nearer to the biblical worlds than we are in England. And you have the potential to read certain passages in Scripture 
instinctively seeing what's there that I don't see because the British culture is significantly distant from this world. I remember the first time I returned from Georgia to England. I, I looked at the map to work out where I'd been. And this was prompted by the fact that on the last day I was here on that trip, we'd been driving around to the city. And I kept noticing the kilometre distances to uh, cities. The first sign told me the distance to Istanbul. And I now realised it was quite a long way because my flight took two hours. For me, that's like travelling from London to Budapest. But then there was the sign that said Terror. And I realised how close I was to Terror. When I went to Yerevan a few years ago, the two buses, one to Yerevan and the other one to Tbilisi, were in adjacent bays at the bus station. So I realised how close I was to the biblical world geographically. I think, for example, you probably too will find it a lot easier to read the Song of Solomon than we do. Because reading some of your epic literature makes me feel closer to the Song of Solomon than English literature. So that's a positive. A potential negative. I suspect as evangelicals in the Caucasus, you are unaware how much you are influenced by the way in which Orthodox or Armenian apostolic reading of scripture happens. I have been in Bible studies, for example, in which uh, a technique for reading the text has owed a lot more to spiritualizing reading. is perhaps justified. And to that extent, you have followed traditions of interpretation that are embedded in Caucasian culture, uh, which may not be consistent, fully consistent with an evangelical, with evangelical convictions. So there are strengths and weaknesses. And the advantage of being able to stand outside of one's own situation, like me when I come to focuses, is that I can become aware of my own vulnerabilities and weaknesses. Uh, but those would be my observations. Thank you. Let's be there to change the
between the Greek text and the English text was perhaps 10 to 15 percent. Hebrew is a very different language. Uh, it's grammar, uh, it's orthography, everything is completely different from anything that I have ever encountered before. And, and I drew the conclusion that I was losing a lot more than 15% from the Hebrew text to my English text. Um, uh, and that's why I particularly enjoy studying the Hebrew text of Scripture because I find that I see things that are there that it's almost impossible to translate into any language, English, Georgian, or, or whatever. Um, so there are difficulties, but I'm still confident that when we place this Bible in the hands of people in Georgia and say, this is the Word of God, we can do that with a considerable degree of, of confidence. Did you